Oh my goodness, I look tired this morning. <laughs> All right, I just got in from doing chores, so we're gonna talk to, uh, blah, blah, blah. the last few days I have been talking about food storage and the order of priority in food storage and the quantities maybe that you keep in food storage. Today I wanted to talk about containers specifically because you don't have to have fancy containers to do food storage. Um, and I, I will definitely go off on a tangent again because that's just who I am and what I do. Everything connects to everything else. The animals connect to each other. The animals connect to the food stores that we keep. And so since this is a homesteading channel, everything loops in on itself. So first thing I'm gonna show you is oil. This is my oil storage. And this is oil we made ourselves. Um, this is from, I'm not sure which one it is. It's either pig fat or duck fat. And so we grow all of our own cooking oil, cooking fat. And um, it means that if we couldn't get butter, if we couldn't get canola oil, if we couldn't get olive oil, it really wouldn't matter. We'd still have our daily needs met because we keep fatty animals. Uh, the three animals that we primarily get fat from are the pigs, the ducks, and the sheep. The sheep have a lot of fat on them too, and you can render their fat down just the same as you can render down lard. Um, every time we cook a duck, we save the oil off of that duck, we put it in a jar, we put it in the fridge, and then we have a year's worth of oil, a year's worth of fat in the fridge at all times, ready to use. So we don't have to buy butter and that kind of thing. <coughs> hey, Camp Patton family. Hey, pepper spray. All right. Yes, what are you working on, honey? Okay, other containers you may not be aware of. Cotton sheets from your secondhand stores are wonderful things to have on hand because of the things you can make them out of. So even though they're not technically containers, they're still, for us, they're technically containers. So you can use flannel sheets to make diapers, menstrual pads, and um, you can use them to make really lovely, fluffy, warmer blankets by taking a thin blanket and putting it between two flannel sheets to make a thicker quilt. So if you see really high quality flannel sheets at your secondhand stores for a couple dollars, it's good to have flannel sheets on hand. You can make clothes out of them too. I've made my kids dresses and stuff out of sheets. Um, hey, Andrea, how are you? Okay, but I wanted to show you this. This is made out of a sheet. This one is just a plain old cotton sheet. It's not flannel. And what I wanted to show you was some of our bacon. This is an old piece that came from something else. So this is our bacon. And it's been salted and cured and it's been out in the smokehouse all winter. And I wrap it up in sheets when I hang it out because sheets are something that allows the meat to breathe. And um, it keeps pests out to some degree, but by the time you've salted and cured bacon, the pests don't want to get in it anyway because it's salty. It's salty and it's dried. So again, I cut up an old sheet, wrapped our bacon in it, and then I hung all the bacon together clustered on a piece of string. So it took up a lot less space. You don't want to store meat in plastic if you're curing it. It keeps it from breathing. And um, it needs to breathe if it's not going to go rancid. Air is essential for cured meat. Um, so fabric can be a container. Again, you can use um, menstrual pads and cloth diapers and stuff like that from normal cotton sheets don't work very well. You want to use flannel sheets. They work better. All right. And Andrew said, how do you keep your hand pump for your water well from freezing? Sorry, this is a water question. <clears throat> I missed the live stream on water, but I'm almost done catching up. So um, because the well is underground, almost 100 feet underground, the water itself doesn't freeze. When you use your hand pump, what you want to do is wipe it down after you've used it. You take a towel out with you in freezing weather and you wipe down the handle. You wipe down everything that has water on it. You wipe it down. And a better solution even is to use the water in your basement in really cold weather. And then as you have a day that isn't as cold, you go out and you pump all your water on a day that is closer to being not freezing. Uh, if you do it um, on a day that is not freezing, you can refill your water storage in your basement or in your containers. And then you're not needing to be as concerned about your pump freezing. However, uh, 
pumps are meant to suck the water back down into the well when they're done. It's only the residual water around the handle and everything that should be freezing. That being said, what we plan to do is to build a, a pallet frame with a hoop of a cow panel over the top. So we have built a little greenhouse over the top of our hand pump so that for use in winter, you can go out there and it'll be 70 degrees at any given time as long as the sun is out and you can pump in warmth and then it'll keep the water from freezing onto the handle and it'll go back down into the well when you're done. So good question. All right, back to containers. Pepper spray said I was just given cotton t-shirt that was cut and tied into a very durable and versatile bag. Haven't seen it done before like this. So the other thing that we do with fabric is that we save all of our cotton fabric and we use it as fire starter in the winter. So we have a big laundry bag and anytime we have a sock that gets a hole in it, anytime we have a t-shirt that we don't use anymore, we stick it in that bag. It's a big laundry bag and we save it as fire starter in the winter. It works way better than paper. Paper will send fly ash up your chimney. Fabric doesn't do the same thing. Instead of clogging your chimney and making a mess, uh, cotton just burns up and it turns into ash and it goes down into your ash ashes. Um, so we save every single last scrap of cotton material that comes into the house and we use it for fire starter. <coughs> we do the same thing for grease. If we have old fat, old grease that went rancid because it got left out on the table or something, we save that grease and we use it on our cotton as fire starters in the winter. If the, if the stove got cold, um, it mean, because your animals won't eat very much fat. Your chickens won't eat very much fat. It's not like you can give it to the pigs and they'll eat the whole thing and be happy. Um, there's a limit to how much fat animals can eat. And so when we have fat go, go rancid, it, instead of wasting it, putting in the garbage, we use it for fire starter. All right, Jennifer. Hello, Christy. Hello. Pepper spray said, what part of the pump typically, typically has the freezing issues, the exposed neck? So the pump itself doesn't have freezing issues. It's just the part of the pump that comes in and out of the casing. So the handle. Um, my pump is a Liberty pump, which means it's made out of PVC. It was inexpensive. It was $350 to put it into my well, and it's made out of PVC. Um, a, a well pump where the water sucks back down into the bottom rather than staying up at the neck, instead of being a pressurized system where it stays at the top, you need a frost-free pump, which means that the water gets sucked back down to the bottom of the well instead of staying in the neck of the pump. And my pump does the same thing. The water goes back down, but it's a slightly messy hand pump. You have some lips. Uh, you have, what was I, what was the word I was trying to use? You have some messes, some spills, some, some water moves. The, the water is just a little bit messier than a straight down because the water goes out sideways on my pump. It's very easy to pump. My six-year-old is the one who pumps it, but there's some drips and some leaks. And those drips and leaks can actually freeze onto the outside part of the pump, which means you now can't get it to go up and down. Not because there's water in the neck, but because there's water around the handle. And so having a little tiny, very inexpensive greenhouse built around your hand pump is not a bad idea for winter. It, it means that when you're out there pumping during the day, the water has a chance to drip off and get off of it. And then, and as long as you're not trying to use your hand pump again before the, it thaws, you're fine. Like if you, if the water freezes and, and you leave for the night and you come back in the morning when it's 70 degrees in that little greenhouse, then it doesn't matter because the water's already melted off and you can use it again. It's not that it hurts the pump to have frozen water on it. it. It's that you can't use it again until it thaws or else you'll break the handle off. All right. All right. Andrea said, I do recall Doug and Stacy having wa winter water issues in a weeping pipe. Um, that releases water within the pipe, but I think they still had a problem. Yeah, so all of our piping is underground. We don't have anything running to the house uh, because our frost depth here is eight feet. And so um, it's not the pipe in the ground that freezes. It's the pipe that's above the ground that freezes if there's water in it. And it's also the pipes in your house if your house freezes that you're worried about. Um, that's why... Uh, in really cold weather, you run a little bit of a drip. If, but it, I mean, if you have a wood stove, you don't have to really worry about it. But if your electricity went out, yeah, you probably have pipes in your house freezing. <clears throat> All right. You're welcome, Andrea. 
Uh, Camp Canton says they soak kindling with oil. Yep. Um, let's see. Christy said she's going to be off grid. She needs to watch my old videos. Yeah, my old ones. Look up Dirt Patch Heaven off grid living. I think I have a playlist for it. I'm just not very good about sharing that kind of thing. Um, Joy Garden said she liked yesterday's when it got cut off because I didn't remember I needed to plug it in. I'm sorry I didn't get everything done there. Um, it is important to have the right containers. The thing that we were talking about was hygiene before I left. Those bottles with the squirt bottle thing that they give you when you have a baby, those are fantastic for hygiene. Um, washcloths work, work better if you're washing the rest of your body, but those hygiene bottles are awesome for bum cleaning. Um, okay, so I did want to get on to more containers. So for food storage and seeds, plastic containers are great. I don't ever buy glass jars or plastic jars. I always get them residually because they had something else in them. I like these because they're square. They had nuts in them. John eats a lot of nuts, so that's where we got these. Um, canning jars make great storage, and you can even sterilize water by putting them through a batch and then putting them on your shelf, but they're very heavy if you do it that way. Um, but a lot of people like in, at least in my area, they like to store their canning jars with water in it as part of their water storage. So it's not a terrible idea. Um, but it's again, very heavy. You don't want it on a high shelf. All right. What, let's see if I can find my other instructions that I wrote for myself. Okay. Other containers for food storage include, and I know this is a little weird, pallets, totes, um, and string. Did I miss anything? And plastic. So the reason for that is because sometimes you have something unorthodox you can bring onto your homestead that is way cheaper um, with those kind of uh, materials. For instance, I can buy one ton of grain and it comes in a massive tote. And I can store all my grain in that tote and then reuse the tote. Um, I, I should do a video on that sometime because you can, what you do is you, you in our barn, we have tied a tote open so that it's lightly supported by the ceiling of the barn. And then we back up with another tote. I don't have a forklift. I don't have a tractor. I have no way to get that full tote out of the back of the truck. So what we do is we back the truck up to the barn where I have that other tote on a pallet, lightly hung from the ceiling. It's not the, once we start putting grain in the new tote, it's not actually weight bearing. Those strings are not weight bearing. They're just holding up the sides of the tote so that it doesn't collapse. So we don't need four more people there holding the tote upright till it's full of grain. So what we do is we back the truck up with the full tote and we start bucketing into the empty tote that's being held up by those strings. We do put it on a pallet, otherwise you're gonna have moisture problems. Anytime you have grain touching the ground, that grain is absorbing moisture. Any kind of grain, any kind of feed you have has to stay up off the ground. Same thing goes for hay, same thing goes for firewood. So as far as a container, pallets, are essential because anytime I buy hay, it goes on pallets. And that means the whole bottom layer of my haystack. If we have a really good rain, a good year with snow, and I don't have my hay up on pallets, I lose the whole bottom layer of hay. So we always put our such expensive feed on pallets. Grain goes on pallets. Even in the garage, grain goes on pallets because if you have a spill, if you have a broken water pipe, or something like that, and it spreads water on the ground, you lose your feed. <laughs> Same thing goes for firewood. Firewood that is in contact with the ground starts to turn into dirt, and you lose your whole bottom layer of firewood if you have it on the ground. So always put it on pallets. <clears throat> so, so then we have the totes. You, you bucket brigade it into the new tote. It, as it fills up, that's great. And then we leave the strings attached so that the sides of the tote don't uh, come down. And just that little teeny tiny bit of support keeps the tote from falling to the side if somebody bumps into it. It keeps animals like goats from being able to get into the grain that's in the tote. And it just works so good. And it means you don't have to have a forklift. You can get grain in bulk supply without having a forklift or a tractor to get it off your truck. All right. Yeah, work smarter, not harder. Um, let's see, IBC totes. Yes, you can use IBC totes. An IBC tote is another fantastic container. We use it as movable goat shelters in the summer. Goats do not like to get wet. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll have a goat shelter 
and we'll feed the goats into the shelter. And as they eat the hay, they poop a little bit. The bottom of the shelter gets a little heavier so that it won't blow away in the wind. But you can also go put random tea posts out in your pasture where you know you're going to graze your goats and just tie the tote to the um, tea post. And we just cut a hole big enough for the goat to get in and we put the butt of it to the wind and we put the opening uh, away from the wind and it works fantastically for grazing shelters for goats. Um, we also use it that same way for pigs. Uh, just a fantastic use of IBC totes. Um, we've also put it in, in places in the garden where we needed to be able to have water storage, where if we had only seasonal water, we would fill those totes up and then we would siphon it out with the hose when we needed it. And I have done that before. IBC totes, you're right, they're, they're fantastic. You can do so much with IBC totes. Uh, make sure they're food grade. All, some IBC totes will have had chemicals in them, scary chemicals in them. Make sure you're getting food grade IBC totes, like that had molasses in it. A lot of times they'll have had molasses in it and that's perfectly safe. <clears throat> All right. All right, Andrea said you're doing well dropping the info on past videos, getting better advertising your previous vids. I know, but I just, I don't put the links in, that's the problem. By the time I have the video and the information out, I have other work that needs to be done on the homestead. And so like I have so like 10 videos that I needed to put in my past live streams and I still haven't done it. Um, yeah, I have so many old videos that I would love you guys to go back and look at and see, but unless you go search for them, it's hard to find them. So I have a million playlists. I don't know where they are, uh, but if you look up my channel and you look up playlists, you could probably find them. Um, I have off-grid playlists, I have uh, wood stove cooking playlists, I have sheet playlists, I have, you know, I have so many playlists. All right. Yeah, Camp Pat and family said we always put the hand pallets even in the barn. Yes, because any ground contact allows moisture to seep and any moisture that seeps causes spoilage. And that's if there's no flooding. That's just ground contact. Um, let's see. Okay, Christy said, I wish I had a barn. I just have a small storage with galvanized cans for animal feed. So ours is not a barn. Ours is a lean-to. And actually, that lean-to came from my neighbor's property when I was growing up. My my, We lived on a little farm when I was a kid. And the neighbor had a calf shelter on his property. When my dad bought his property when I was like 13, he took that calf shed from the neighbor's property and moved it to his property and rebuilt it there for calves. It's just a loafing shed. It's a very, very small, it's like 20 feet by maybe 10 feet, 20 by 10 feet. And um, it's just a loafing shed, which means it's open to the elements. And um, when my dad sold his farm, he asked me if I wanted that loafing shed. And so it moved 45 miles from my dad's old farm to our new farm and we rebuilt it and put it up and now it's our barn, but really it's an, an open face loafing shed. It's not a real barn. I would love to build a barn. Uh, what I would really like to do is do like some rammed earth or some uh, cob and build a passive solar barn for my animals in the winter. I would love to do that. I don't have the money for it because we don't have clay soil, um, but it's on my bucket list. If, um, if I had the opportunity, that's one of the things that I would do. Okay. Southern Prairie said, I, Julie just put an order of seeds at Main Street. So unhappy with the germination rate of Baker's Creek. Um, I've had really good success with Baker's Creek. I The thing that I struggle with, with with a lot of seed companies is the size of the packet for the amount you get, like 3 to $5 for a packet that has this much seed in it. So Main Street Seed and Supply, yes, is a fantastic place because you can get a pound of seed with different, depending on the type of seed it is, it'll be somewhere between like $4 and $12 for a pound of seed. And that's how I do my massive gardens is because I, I like to have enough seed for two or three years. And I like to have enough seed that if one batch doesn't make it, I can just go reseed and it doesn't hurt my pocketbook. And so I... Yeah, Main Street Seed and Supply is where I get my garden seeds. The bulk, no pun intended, the bulk of my garden seeds, I buy bulk from Main Street Seed and Supply. I do get experimental seeds in packets from other companies, but I spend very little money there. I'll spend like $40 at a time instead of, um, instead of getting very much because if you're really growing food for your family, it takes a lot of seeds to do that, a lot of seeds to do that. 
And why spend money on little teeny packets when you can get them by the pound for five and six dollars? You know what I mean? All right. Jennifer said, I love your playlist. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Christy Bet said, no problem with wild critters getting into the feed. We have rascal raccoons. So we do have raccoons. And um, when our feed is in the garage, we've also done this in the garage. You can do it in the garage and that's fine too. We just put it out there because um, it was where we had space at the time and it worked so well, we would totally do it again. I do not have a problem with critters getting into the main feed. And the reason for that is that when my chickens and everything are eating, they're kind of messy and they spill a little bit of feed. And so the wild birds go eat the, the grain with the chickens or or the mice that we might have. We don't really have mice because the chickens and the cats pretty much, we don't have mice. Um, yeah, we don't have a problem with mice. But if we did have a problem with mice, what happens is that when you have that little bit of spill when you're getting your grain, it spills on the ground and the mice don't really want to go hunt for grain. They might as well eat the grain that's there at the bottom of the feed sack, like at the bottom by the pallet. And so if there's anything they eat, they just eat that there. The chickens go clean up the rest of that grain. And so uh, we have had no problem with that. And the, the tote sack is like up to here on me. And so even though we have deer that roam through our property, um, we've never had deer get into the grain. If we did have deer get into the grain, we would just put up a different... Um, like probably a block tarp, a uh, block, a blockage with a tarp hanging from the front of the building with a log attached to the bottom to hold it flat. And that would keep the deer out. Um, along that line, if you have problem with predation with deer for your haystacks, what you do is you take old chicken wire and you take those forked uh, fabric stakes, you know, the, the, the fabric stakes. Do you know what I'm talking about? They kind of look like a bobby pin, but they're really big. Garden fabric stakes, thank you. You take old chicken wire and you lay it along the side of your hay stack um, where the where the um, where the tarp comes down and doesn't go anymore. You take chicken wire and run it along the length of your hay stack and you and you attach it to the hay itself with those fabric stakes, those garden stake things, all the way around. We were having problems with deer getting into our hay and eating through the bottom, through, eating through the strings and thing in the, in the bottom of the hay. So I just went and took chicken wire, ran it all the way along. I had plenty of old chicken wire and I just plugged it in with those steaks and we haven't lost another thing because they can't eat through the chicken wire. Um, and you just do it all the way along the bottom. I would assume you'd already have a tarp on it. So you just put the, start the chicken wire where the tarp ends. <coughs> all right. Southern Prairie Homes has said, I keep my seeds in metal garbage cans with diatomaceous earth for pests. I, I keep it in the shed. And that's for your farm seed for, for uh, crops. Okay. All right. Hudson Valley Seed Company in New York has great bulk pricing. Thank you for sharing that. I'll go look. In fact, I'll write that down. Um, Hudson Valley. Valley Seed Company in New York. Okay, I will go check that out. Um, Main Street Seed and Supply does not have a very broad range of seeds. They have heirloom seeds, non-GMO heirloom seeds, but they'll have like six varieties of peas and, and like 12 varieties of corn. Whereas, um, so sometimes your favorite type of seed may not be there, but it's more of like the heritage type, the old fashioned type. And so I'm always happy to find a new source of bulk seed because sometimes they might have a variety that Main Street Seed and Supply doesn't have. Um, let's see. Um, Andrea said, I've had access to two liter soda plastic crates as plastic pallets in basement. Flooding problems helped create the idea to, to solve wet contamination. Exactly. Solution, solutions. All right. Okay, Kai, can you go switch the laundry? I think it needs to go in the dryer, please. Thank you. Um, Camp Hatton said we had bad results with wall wall onions from town and country here in Southeast Idaho. Um, wide family farm in Ohio also had poor results with Walla Walla this year. I'm not very good at onions yet. I try with onions, but who was it yesterday that told me that I need to fertilize them more? Somebody said that. Um, I did fine with just my onions, but they, they're never spectacular. They're never amazing. 
Um, Andrew said, I'm appalled at how farmers treat their hay in my area. We cross state line to get hay that promised to be kept out of the rain. Yeah, you have to be so careful. It's so expensive. <coughs> we bought some that got wet last year. And he, he, I have a very, very honest farmer. And he told me that it got a little wet. He didn't think it was very wet, but a little bit. And I bought everything he had. And it's really funny because that's the only thing we fed the animals this year. And um, we went through three ton, which I'm really surprised we didn't go through more considering how many animals we have. But it turned out just fine. We had very few bales that weren't good. And then now we still have a whole nother like four ton to go through for this year. So I feel very blessed on hay. That being said, I'm neurotic about having enough hay on hand for all my animals just in case I need to bring new animals in. I want to make sure I have enough. So I, I way over purchase on hay and grain, anything like that I over purchase. Okay. Dixondale onion sets are amazing. I've been buying them for years with great success. Nitrogen is the biggies once a week. Okay. So it must've been Southern Prairie Home said he told me that. Dixondale onions. Dixondale. And is that a type of onion or is that your source for onions? What are you doing? He can't be up here, honey. No, you can't. No, he will scratch at the door and he will make a noise. You can put him in his kennel or you can take him outside, but not on the deck right now. Thank you. All right. What am I missing? Southern Prairie Homes has said so much of my broccoli is going to seed. We're very warm for this time of year. Hope tarp in the afternoon helps. Uh-huh. Hi, Grandma Ginger. And Andrea said, I wish I could give away some of my clay. It's so hard packed. I've snapped shovels and picks on handles. We do more <coughs> um, of the no dig layering roost out and you want a winter hotbed greenhouse. So the reason that I do the hotbeds is because we have rocks. We have big rocks like this and almost no soil between the rocks. We're pretty much a gravel bed. And so I have to build my own soil with uh, the lasagna garden method. Exactly. Um, I, I, I do wish I had clay just because I could make more structures. Our soil is very alkaline and it's silt. It's just silt, which doesn't hold together well in buildings and things like that. So if I ever wanted to do something like that, some kind of um, passive solar barn out of um, copper or anything, I do have to bring in clay. All right. High mowing seed is excellent. Yeah, that's what I know is high mowing seed can be pricey. I have, I have bought alfalfa seed from high mowing. And um, they weren't, I mean, they weren't terrible, but they weren't as inexpensive as the, as the Main Street Seed and Supply. But I will write that down. High mowing seed. Um, Eden Brothers also, if I remember correctly, has had some types of like pasture seed. But I try really hard not to get dreamy about what I want to do with pastures. Instead, I try really hard to focus on letting the pasture be what it is and focusing really hard on the garden during the growing season. That's why I buy so much hay. All right. Yeah, go switch your laundry, everybody. That's what you're doing this morning. Um, okay, Christy said it gets too hot here for me to grow broccoli in the spring, so I grow it in the fall. Brilliant. And a lot of Asian uh, vegetables, Asian greens are like that. Like they have uh, Asian radishes and Asian broccoli that does very well in fall planting, but does badly in spring planting. So I guess I should try to get back to some of my containers, but I think I talked about all of them. I talked about the totes. I talked about the pallets. I talked about glass, plastic, fabric, and string. So I will probably run now and go get some of my other chores done. Most things I hold on to to use for containers later. I hold on to my feed sacks to make the hotbeds. I hold on to my tarps to make the hotbeds. I, I hold on to a lot of plastic that we come in contact with that are big pieces because I use them as row covers in the garden like um, like greenhouse plastic, except it was free. So um, that's another great source is mattress stores that have those big swaths of plastic that came off of um, mattresses. They work really, really well for building greenhouses. Not for the part that goes over, but the, for the part that goes on the side or the part that goes on the doors, that kind of thing. It's really good plastic. Um, that being said, I do like to have several rolls of greenhouse plastic on hand at any given time so that if I couldn't get it in a couple years, I have. I like to stay about two years ahead on greenhouse plastic just so that if I want to make another one, I already have the plastic and I know I have it. It's just, I'm crazy that way. Um, 
Frugal Prepper, how are you? It's so good to see you. Um, Southern Prairie said, onions need nitrogen once a week. They're heavy feeders. Indiana, okay, Andrew said, Indiana has cheap living expenses outside of major metro areas, rural living. Oh, they keep skipping for me. I'm losing it. Sorry, guys. It's trying to skip on me as I move it. Frugal Prepper said, Dixon Dales are great. I have a garden that always has some starts left over to give me. They always grow well. So that must be a type of onion. I've never heard of that before. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, so it's a store. Dixon Dales is a store. All right, Julie asked, putting dry goods in five-gallon buckets lined with food-grade five-gallon bucket bags, that is the amount of oxygen absorbers do I need to add, except the sugar, of course. So what I do instead is I do, I think I already took it downstairs, so I did this one two days ago. What I do is I put my dry goods inside Ziploc bags, like a quart size Ziploc bag, because that's about how much we use at any given time of something we bring up, whether it's oatmeal, dry beans, sugar, Ziploc bag, and then I put that inside the bucket and the reason for that is because when every time you open the bucket like you said you're letting moisture in if they're in ziploc bags no moisture gets into the individual packets you can put an oxygen absorber in each one of those if you want to i don't but i do not live in a moist area i live in an arid area so there's probably better uh answers here in the in the comments on this kind of thing but i know for me in order to keep moisture out i put it in ziploc bags and then I put pack it into the five gallon bucket and then I seal it. And I don't have any problem with things getting moisture in them because the smaller size um, Ziploc bag means it gets taken out. There's no spilling. There's no moisture contamination in the individual, individual bags. And if I did want to put in oxygen, ox, oxygen absorbers, I only need one oxygen absorber per Ziploc bag. That makes sense. <coughs> Mrs. O said, are the Dixondale long day or short day onions? Um, Fedco is also very good. My mom likes to use Fedco. I'm losing it. I'm not staying up on what people are asking. Um, I'm not sure what kind mine are. It's very difficult to grow anything in clay, so it needs a lot of amending. Well, and the same thing goes for silt and the same thing goes for sand. I think... The reason that farming used to be different than it is now is that those farmers who amended their soil and had better soil every year, if you pass your farm on to the next generation, it stays that way. If you pass your farm on to someone who doesn't care about farming, then the soil suffers. And so even in areas that have just sand or just clay or just silt, my children are going to inherit a much different property than what I purchased. And the reason for that is because I build my soil up. And so I don't think it matters what type of soil you have as long as you are building it up. You are passing it on with good soil to whoever comes next. And hopefully you sell it to a farmer or your kids, you know, take it and, and it stays beautiful and happy. Have I ever had seeds from Snake River Seed Cooperative? I have. Um, they didn't like flash in my mind of something amazing. Uh, one seed company I truly love is Territorial Seed Company. They always have great germination. They're not as expensive as others, and you can get them in larger quantities. Not, not necessarily pound quantities, but larger quantities, and I have amazing germination with them. I love Territorial Seed Company. However, I don't buy my seeds from them because I can't afford to buy them in that kind of bulk. Um, Asian lettuce. I'm sorry. It keeps moving me forward. Yeah. Soil issues by raised beds and you truck in mulch and you truck in <laughs> rabbit manure and you just do your best, don't you? Um, Frugal Prepper said, I'm just not doing a huge garden this year. I'm just too busy with other things. Well, and if you already have food storage and you already have other things going on and you're not concerned about feeding your family. Yeah, you don't have to do a huge garden if you already have canned goods and other things. Um, I don't know what kind of garden I'm doing this year. I'm filling it out and doing it as I have energy. And I'm always trying to find simpler ways of doing things so that um, it makes it easier for my family so that when I'm sick, my family can take care of it. Girls, are you in the living room speaking of family? Okay, I need you guys. What else needs to be done? Nothing else needs to be done? 
Um, I probably better go because I've got kids who think that there's nothing else that needs to be done. So we should probably go do something. All right. I hope I didn't miss any um, anything. But again, back to fabric as containers, glass jars as containers. Tomorrow I would like to talk about fat. So I'm going to talk about how we get our fat from our animals into jars, what animals we use, what we use the fat for. That's what I'd like to talk about tomorrow. And um, anyway, I better go because my kids need some directing. We have some projects to get done. So uh, if you want to hear my like we lately it's been about every third day that I've done a post on my Patreon account um, just because I've been too busy outside and I haven't had any epiphanies. But every time I have an epiphany, I make a post on my Patreon. You're welcome to go support the channel there. And uh, things that don't make it into the video or that make it into videos like in the middle of a 30 minute video. So you miss them. Those are the things I'm talking about on Patreon. So I think it's in the link in the description and I'm going to go talk to you later.